what probably is one of the most extraordinary Sasquatch uh, stories you will ever hear. We have been talking about Sasquatch on this radio program for ever since Art Bell started it, and we have never been able to really come to a conclusion about what it was. We have listened to hoaxers. We have listened to fake and possibly real Sasquatch calls. We have talked to everybody, but we have never before talked to Jeff Meldrum about his book, Sasquatch, Legend and Science. And something has happened. And I'll just sum it up very simply. Dr. Jane Goodall, the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute, one of the one of the famed scientists working with primates, has said this about this book. Jeff Meldrum's book, Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science, brings a much-needed level of scientific analysis to the Sasquatch or Bigfoot debate. Welcome, Jeff Meldrum, to the program. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, it's very exciting to have you here because we have a uh, great interest on, the, on Dreamland in credible edge science, and uh, that's what the show is all about. And very often we go out onto an edge and it's not so credible. <laughs> but this is different. This is the best Sasquatch book I personally have ever read, uh, to be honest with you, and I've read a lot of them. Well, thank you. It has also been a source of wonder for me. Can you tell me a little bit about... Why you came to this? Because you have you have taken this to a new level. This is not a this is not really speculative anymore. Uh, once one reads this book, you you know there is something out there. From and, and there are prominent scientists who are agreeing with you more than than Jane Goodall, uh, Peter Matheson, uh, uh, Esteban Sarmento, uh, research associate at the Ma- American Museum of Natural History. Uh, quite a laundry list of of prominent names, names that never would have spoken out about this before your book. Well, that, that was been, or has been one of the objectives of, of, this, uh, of this endeavor, was to try to, to elevate the, the level of discourse, to try to, to uh, move this from the realm of the, uh, uh, you know, just being lumped in with all things paranormal, considered paranormal or, or mysterious, to a simple question of biological science, and that is, is there a biological species of primate that lies behind the legend of Sasquatch? And we have tried to, uh, to enumerate the evidence as, as it uh, is currently understood that suggests that, in fact, there is a, an unrecognized species of primate out there. And I think that's, that's where, I mean, we've always been challenged by, by this, uh, the, the unfortunate stigma that, that has, <clears throat> um, has, has lumped this subject with, uh, with uh, various and sundry other topics, some of which, I mean, I'm not passing judgment on any of these others, but, uh, but many of which have not been fortunate enough to have uh, uh, the, uh, the solid evidence, the uh, physical evidence and trace evidence that, that is mounting um, in the case of the question of Sasquatch. And, and uh, so some scientists, many scientists, have, have shied away from it, those that were interested that weren't, uh, that weren't uh, prone to, in a knee-jerk reaction, reject it outright and offhandedly. Um, yes. Now, now we're starting to have more people speak out a little bit and say, well, yes, we, we really should look at this. We really should consider this uh, data as, uh, as scientists are, are charged to, to do. You know, uh, Tom Slick was a good friend of, friend of my family's, and mm-hmm. his, I guess she is his daughter-in-law, uh, or by marriage, uh, well, obviously by marriage, <laughs> she's his daughter-in-law. Uh, Catherine Nixon Cook is, is a dear friend of ours to this day. Yeah. And I know uh, Catherine Cook recently... Uh, went to uh, to uh, Nepal and retraced Tom Slick's footsteps, and he was the first to really put any stock in any of this. And he attempted back in the 50s, with all sorts of limitations we don't have now, 
a scientific expedition in search of the of the Yeti. Now, it, and let me begin by asking if you think that this is a uh, an international phenomenon, or is it just confined to the uh, Olympic Forest, for example? Well, there, there certainly are um, elements of the, the wild man motif, the icon, uh, sprinkled throughout cultures uh, worldwide. It does really seem to be a, a universal phenomenon, and there's been a lot of very interesting discussion about why that is, if this is some um, a holdover of our uh, of, of, of times early in the history, the prehistory of the human family, when we very likely shared this planet with other hominids and other very human-like apes that were more common than they are today. Or is it much more pragmatic, much more fundamental, in that there simply are uh, some of those species uh, persisting in various corners uh, in appropriate habitats around the globe? It's not um, a uniform uh, uh, experience. Uh, for example, the Yeti that uh, drew Slick's attention to the Himalayas. The um, We've done some interesting things on, on analyzing some of the footprints that have been attributed to the Yeti, and uh, a great number of them can easily be uh, uh, dismissed as, uh, or, or explained rather, as uh, misidentified uh, footprints of, of common wildlife like bears, for example. And, and there seems to be a blurring, in fact, in between the in the boundary between the notion of a bear-like figure and an ape-like figure amongst the uh, Sherpas and, and uh, indigenous populations yes. in that region. And the, uh, the wait, wait, the yeah. bear-like figure enters quite a bit yeah. into your uh, and into your book, and right. how I think quite often people are thinking that bears are actually. Uh, 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 of various kinds are actually Sasquatch. That happens a lot. I think that does. Uh, I think it does. And and uh, you're right. In, in the book, uh, Lynn Rogers, uh, a brilliant uh, bear biologist, uh, discusses that. Uh, he actually thinks that it's probably more likely uh, the the reciprocal, and that is that people may see a Sasquatch, and and because they cannot fit it into their worldview, into their frame of reference. They they rationalize it as well. It must have been a bear, and that that may have ha- may happen as often as other misidentifications in the reverse. Be seeing a, a flash of brown fur as a bear retreats uh, from human contact, and and of course the imagination gets the better of the witness, and they uh, they think Sasquatch must be uh, the the answer. Right. Um, so it's uh, misidentification is an important factor. I mean, just uh, about a couple weeks ago, I had two. Two instances of people bringing uh, footprints to my attention, photographed in the field, and in both cases they were uh, superimposed, or registered uh, foreign hind paws of a bear. One one was a very intriguing trackway down a, a dusty uh, uh, road that uh, where the bear had uh, had very consistently stepped, such that the hind paws just overlapped, just overstepped, and, and uh, overlapped the, the toes of the forepaw leaving a, what appeared to be a bipedal track with an admittedly wide straddle or wide uh, step width and a uh, very short step length, but this elongated, uh, alternating pattern of uh, elongated footprints. And But on closer examination, and thankfully the photographer took some very good, crisp uh, close-ups, you could point out very clearly the hind pad or the pad of the, of the forepaw with its... Uh, concavity on its back surface and, and some of the, the toes that escaped the uh, overstepping hind paw and you could see the divided pad of the, the hind paw with its metatarsal pad and its calcaneal pad and there were no evident uh, claw marks the claws were obviously worn down considerably but but th- th- that does happen and we, we need to deal with that but I think it's very nearsighted and very naive for the uh, for the armchair skeptic to simply dismiss all footprints as uh, as misidentified bear tracks. I mean, there now, clearly are distinguishing characteristics. We're going to have a take a little break, and when we come back, we're going to be talking more about what Sasquatch may actually be if Sasquatch exists as it apparently does. And then later in the show, we'll be asking you for your questions about this because for 
The first time we are in beta test on blogtv.com, and this show is being broadcast live over Blog TV, and you can ask questions via the Blog TV chat room in the Dreamland section. The book Sasquatch Legend Meets Science by Jeff Meldrum, a very extraordinary and fine book about Sasquatch, available in stores everywhere, available from our Amazon.com store on UnknownCountry.com, and subscribe to UnknownCountry.com. Keep us going. We are subscriber-supported. We'll be right back. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Online. I'm going to use this first break to talk a little bit about Blog TV. We are going to be broadcasting Dreamland live on Blog TV as the program is made, and our subscribers will be receiving an email telling you when these broadcasts will take place. If you're a non-subscriber, you can use Blog TV to give you a reminder about when the next program will be aired. On Blog TV, you will be able to see my face, sometimes also the face of my guest, if the guest has a webcam, and you will be able to listen live as we produce Dreamland and be able to send us questions over the chat interface on Blog TV. Now, to do this, you need to go first to blogtv.com and register as a user if you are going to chat. There will be direct access to Blog TV over unknowncountry.com as well. There will be a direct link to our Blog TV viewer. So enjoy this new and exciting way of participating in Dreamland. If you have difficulty using Blog TV, please contract Blog TV customer support, not unknowncountry.com customer support or unknowncountry.com subscribers customer support. We cannot help you with, obviously, with Blog TV problems, but it's very easy to use, so I don't think too many of you will have trouble with it. It's just important to know, remember, if you want to chat, you must first register with Blog TV. Otherwise, you can just enjoy and watch and listen live as we produce Dreamland. As soon as the system is up and running and we have a new show to prepare, subscribers will be informed by email. But we do not have anything on Blog TV right now, and we are not broadcasting on Blog TV at this time. All of our normal audio streams will continue to run as usual. Of course, we have no plans to change any of our audio streams. And now let's get back to our conversation with Jeff Meldrum, the author of Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science, available in bookstores everywhere. Jeff has brought a level of understanding to this, which indicates that there should be much more scientific discourse, because it's an important issue. And Jeff, before we go on further, why don't you let us know what you think these creatures are and right. okay just that and then we'll go on from there all right well my my null hypothesis and i know that there's considerable uh, varying opinions on on this subject but my my null hypothesis my working uh, you know starting point is that that we're dealing with a large ape that this uh, that all of the reports uh, seem to be devoid of the the, the trappings that are associated with what we consider to be uh, later hominids uh, or humans in in uh, in our evolutionary history, uh, from the from the uh, first appearance of the genus Homo, uh, we have material artifacts. We have stone tools and wooden tools and 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 various things. You know, with the advances uh, um, accompanying the archaeological record of, of human prehistory, and all of the reports and all of the um, the uh, descriptions of Sasquatch's uh, its behavior and anatomy seem to be devoid of these and yet find very readily their their correlates amongst the anatomy and behavior of the known great apes, the chimp, gorilla, and orang. And uh, other than its superficial resemblance to humans and its habit of walking on, on two legs, which is an interesting um, uh, adaptation and has often been thought to be a rather unique adaptation of of uh, human evolution, um, I think sometimes too much stock is placed in the uniqueness of characteristics in in evolutionary history. I think as we learn more about evolution, we one of the I think is the fascinating things is nature's ability to solve uh, problems in very similar ways, especially from from rather similar starting points. 
And so a large ape in Asia, a large terrestrial ape restricted to the ground by its size and mass with the, the fundamental anatomy of, a, of an ape, uh, in my opinion, could, would readily have evolved bipedalism in response to energetic selection pressures and mechanical selection pressures of, of its limbs and its extremities that would have paralleled those taking place in Africa with the advent of bipedalism in, uh, in early hominid evolution, the early ancestors of the lineage that eventually gave rise to the human family. So that's, that's kind of where I'm, I'm approaching it from. And, uh, of course, I'm, I'm always open to alternate interpretations and alternate uh, hypotheses that are supported by data. But, but to date, I haven't, I haven't personally experienced any of that data that suggests uh, extraordinary intelligence or other powers or abilities. I mean, it just seems to be a very reclusive, very elusive uh, great ape, very rare in its habitat, very uh, very able to avoid, uh, avoid the, uh, encounters with humans when it desires to. One of, the, uh, one of the things about the elusiveness that you point out of mammals in the, in the, in the book is that they're their equipment, as it were, their uh, eyes, their ears, their sense of smell, it gives them an ability to be very, very careful about who sees them and who doesn't and witness the mountain lion, which is here in California and occasionally will leap out of nowhere and attack somebody on a, on a hiking path. Uh, th- these animals are incredibly elusive. Yeah. Remarkably. Well, even here in Pocatello, I mean, we go about our day and our routine, and, and people in Pocatello, are, are a large number, are active in the outdoors, and they hike, and they bike, and they cross-country ski, and yet uh, very rarely do you ever see sign of cougars, and yet there have been studies conducted by members of my own department uh, where they've radio-collared these cougars, and, and there are a significant number within a 50-mile radius of the town of uh, the city of Pocatello. So they are, they are able to. You're right. They're able to uh, remain extremely elusive. And so I don't I don't think that we have to, you know, resort to extraordinary explanations for uh, how, admittedly, a very large animal um, uh, can remain uh, evasive and elusive in in uh, in its very remote uh, habitat. We have a question from a listener. What do you? What other alternatives could have you ever entertained? Let me put it that way. That's the easiest way to explain this. Right. Well, the uh, you know it, it has been suggested, for example, that uh, maybe Bigfoot is uh, an earlier hominid that uh, before the appearance of the genus Homo, uh, which is associated with material culture, and these earlier bipeds. I mean, this approach would, would assume that, that bipedalism is such a unique characteristic that it's rather unlikely that it would have evolved independently in, in such a similar way uh, more than once. And so that shared characteristic would have been inherited from a common ancestor. Therefore, Bigfoot would have been an offshoot from this early hominid radiation uh, like uh, the robust Australopithecines. And there are some, there are some really remarkable uh, resemblances in the... I, I did a little study one time where I took the skull of Zinjanthropus, you know, formerly called Zinjanthropus, Australopithecus boise. Right. And Could you explain to us just briefly what that is exactly? Yeah. This is a this was a hominid uh, that that existed in Africa up uh, into the early uh, into the early Pleistocene. It, the early Pleistocene folks being the early what what about thirty thousand years ago at this point? Well, at least yeah, more more like. Uh, uh, Five hundred thousand years ago. Oh, so uh, much, uh, quite uh, five hundred thousand years ago, yeah, quite a long time ago. Half okay, a million years ago, yeah. And uh, but but it developed uh, extreme adaptations of its chewing apparatus: very deep, heavy jaws and uh, high, thick cheekbones, uh, and and a crest on the skull to support the muscles that would drive these very large uh, jaws, uh, uh, carrying very thick enameled, thick crowned teeth. And, and I did a little, just a little graphic to show if you took the skull of this very robust, very heavily uh, boned uh, hominid and uh, juxtaposed it against a, a blow-up, a close-up of the subject of the Patterson-Gimlin film, there was remarkable congruence in the proportions and the various landmarks of that, that skull 
to those that were evident and visible on the, the Patterson Gimlin film. This simply suggesting, to my mind, that that uh, the Bigfoot shares some of these same uh, extreme adaptations of, uh, of uh, the cranium for heavy chewing heavy, coarse uh, food items. Um, but some would take that similarity to suggest that maybe uh, maybe uh, uh, Sasquatch is a giant form a large form of uh, of this robust australopithecine uh, species or group of species that existed in in Africa the, the you know the, the challenge of that suggestion that proposal is this tremendous gap between um, Africa and North America across Asia with uh, at this point anyway an area of fossil record in between and the, the disparity in size and and, uh, and habitat and so forth. Whereas in the form of Gigantopithecus, this giant ape that, that lived in the Pleistocene uh, up until presumably as well uh, acknowledged uh, as, as recently as 250,000, 300,000 years ago uh, in Eastern Asia, a large terrestrial ape with some of the same adaptations of these of the jaws and teeth and so forth, although our fossil record of, of that form is very, very limited. But here you have an animal that's the right size, in the right place, at the right time, to have to be a very reasonable candidate for a species that could have extended its range across the Bering Land Bridge into North America. Now, when, when I say Bering Land Bridge, oftentimes people immediately imagine or envision this windswept, cold Arctic tundra uh, just joining between Siberia and Alaska. And, and admittedly, at times, it was that kind of a, an environment. But many people are unaware that at other times, it was a lush, uh, uh, temperate forest that extended from southern China all the way into British Columbia as one contiguous habitat of a mixed coniferous and, and uh, deciduous forest. Uh, and so it, it seems very reasonable that uh, that a gigantopithecus could have just through the extension the natural extension of its home range into the more northerly latitudes as the climates permitted spread into north america and exploited the same types of forest habitats many of the same species of plants and trees and so forth that were available and the same resources so, salmon and so forth so it would have been it wouldn't have even this animal or if it is an animal wouldn't have even had to have left its habitat now when we get back a number of you are asking about the Patterson film and that is of course one of the big centerpieces in this book we will be addressing that later in the show we're also going to be addressing if sasquatch is a prehominid where does human begin and animal end and where are we there with this remarkable creature subscribe to unknowncountry.com if you subscribe to unknowncountry.com you get not only the streaming audio of this program but you get a four-year archive plus all kinds of special perks and remarkable uh, special interviews sasquatch legend meets science by jeff meldrum available in bookstores everywhere and if you have even the slightest interest in this subject or no interest you should get this book because it will open your mind. This is real. There's something out there. This is Whitley Strever. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strever. It's Dreamland. For those of you who are watching and listening as we make this program live on Blog TV, welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, this is our beta test. We are testing this process right now we are not actually uh, our most of our listeners do not know that there that you can even do this but they will soon and there will be more of you there so if you have any questions for jeff meldrum please uh, ask in the chat room and we will see them and respond right away now jeff before we left the air and we're going to get to the patterson video just very shortly but before we left the air i asked you a question about the uh, degree to which this if this is a pre-hominid is it an animal or a human being and how do we do you have any sense of where we are in terms of evolution with this this creature right well the the, de the definition of, of human being has kind of uh, uh, been rather amorphous and, and uh, almost a political 
issue in, in in various discussions. I I think that we you know you know from a strict taxonomic sense we we reserve that title of human being to members of the species Homo sapiens. And uh, for example, there's been recent debates of whether that should extend that title should extend to even uh, close allies like the Neanderthals. And some would suggest that it's a distinct species, Homo neanderthalensis. Some would say, no, it's a subspecies. It's capable of interbreeding. It was just a, you know, a somewhat isolated population for some time, and so it should be Homo neanderthalensis sapi or Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. Um, I think that we're we're enough removed that 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 those types of issues aren't even at question. Um, if Sasquatch is human, and and I'm not going to completely rule out that possibility, but. I'm just saying that if it is, then then we have to entertain a definition of humanity that is yes. very, very different. Than, I, than I guess what I'm asking is this. If Sasquatch is, say, Java man, mm-hmm. uh, if, it's, so if Sasquatch is Australopithecus, it, it's not yet human, almost certainly. But if it's something right. else, like Java right. man, for example, exactly. could it be? Well, then then you have to uh, explain. Uh, if, if, that, if that's your working hypothesis, then you have to propose an explanation for how a species, Homo erectus or Homo ergaster in Africa, which is known to have an extensive fossil record, a, a very distinctive toolkit, uh, controlled use of fire, home bases, you know, right. structures, and so forth, why is it that this species then suddenly abandoned all of those accoutrements and adopted what appears to be a, a, a behavior, a behavioral repertoire that's more aligned with the great apes, uh, with no or very little modification of its environment, uh, very little in the way of the uh, use or uh, manipulation of, of uh, material objects to, uh, to uh, go about its foraging and food processing, etc. Uh, instead, like I said, everything that we... Uh, and I think one of the first people who really, well, well, several have, uh, Mr. John Green in his book, The Apes Among Us, really drove home this notion that we were dealing with a great ape. John Bindernagel in his book, uh, North America's Great Ape, The Sasquatch, does a very good job of, of uh, reviewing for the lay reader the literature on primate uh, and great ape anatomy and behavior and does a great job of showing how many of the reports that he has investigated firsthand and particularly centered in the in uh, the Pacific Northwest or Western Canada and British Columbia, um, uh, show show analogy to anatomies and behaviors and vocalizations and and so forth uh, of of the, the known great apes. I mean, it fits that pattern, and and that's why I'm still in the point that it, it for me it fits that pattern so well. It's it's the more straightforward explanation that doesn't require resorting to some other extraordinary explanation or 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 elaboration of, of the definition of, of uh, humanity and so forth to, to accommodate this otherwise anomalous uh, uh, situation. Well, it's, yeah, it, so it could be, and you know, you speak about, and it went past me a little quickly, about the creature who who went back, who who abandoned the accoutrements of, of pre-hominid life, of fire and so forth, and went back to being a great ape without any real change in its environment. And that was a, a subject that interested me a lot a few years ago. I, I read about this, and it was fascinating to me because it made me think about various events that have happened in the course of human culture where civilizations have suddenly sim- simply walked away from themselves, most notably the Mayans, and uh, 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 and yet the, in, the Yucatan is still full of Mayan people who no longer have anything to do with their civilization, and one wonders if they ha- weren't, if it, if it wasn't just a better or easier lifestyle, that they didn't have, the, that the environment wasn't really making the demands on them that were necessary for them to continue to evolve in the direction of being uh, more advanced. Sure, and that's and that's an intriguing possibility, and, and you're right. There are there are examples of of cultures. Uh, reverting, uh, you know, or, or I shouldn't say reverting, but abandoning certain levels of technology. I mean, our technological prowess uh, balances precariously on this little pinpoint of, of our uh, 
uh, energy resources. And should those come to a screeching halt, we would be, we would take uh, quite a, a large step backward. We would in, in our technological yes. uh, uh, mastery of, of, of our environment. But yet, even even then, I mean, even when we go back to, you know, some of the earliest uh, civilizations, the least technologically advanced, they still have uh, a rich material culture of some sort, and they have they 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 communicate. They have uh, oral traditions. They have uh, mythology. They have all these things, and I'm not saying that the that, that Sasquatch. I mean, I, I have no basis to say that they don't. But but on the other hand, I have no basis to say that they do. I have no evidence to suggest. Uh, you know, they're not leaving pictographs anywhere that we know of. They're not. But there are uh, Indian uh, pictographs that suggest that people were seeing them quite a while ago. Yes. Oh, exactly. Oh, exactly. I know. Tell us a little I, bit about those. Yeah. Well, and that's quite interesting. We, I've actually taken a much more pointed interest in this more recently. We've we've been working in Wyoming with uh, some colleagues. Uh, one in particular is, is a uh, an archaeologist and has um, shared some of his insights that he's garnered from uh, his Native American contacts and his survey of various pictographs and from from the depiction very anatomically um, accurate depictions of footprints that are quite distinct from those that are clearly. Um, identified as belonging or you know uh, being uh, indicating human footprints, for right. example, broad, uh, uh, flat footprints without an arch and different toe composition or toe row right. configuration. Uh, but also figures, uh, interesting figures that are uh, embellished with the very broad shoulders, small head, oftentimes with exaggerated hands and feet, uh, five digits and, and long, dexterous fingers and so forth. That whereas the humans are then otherwise rendered as simple stick figures. Right. So why is there this? Well, you know, if you if you encountered an animal that instead of having hooves or paws with claws had a remarkably human-like a, uh, hand, this is one of the things that's always been, it's always stunning when people, uh, you know, are so, so uh, uh, enamored by watching monkeys and, right. and apes is their manual dexterity and, and, you know, they have nails instead of claws like we do and it, it, it's a common link, sort of, so to speak. And so right. I think an, an indigenous people who would encounter an animal that um, uh, had some of those characteristics would be remarkably impressed by that, and then would go to great lengths to depict that in their in their art. And that seems to be the case. You know, recently um, there, there's a lot of um, has been said about this stone foot that was uh, that's on display up in a museum in in British Columbia. Which tell appears, us a little bit about this, if you will. Uh, uh, again, we, we are indebted to John Green for drawing our attention to this, but there's, there is this uh, carved foot uh, of a large scale. In fact, it's, uh, there's a broken off, a couple of broken off pieces, the apparent big toe based on its uh, differential enlargement of the circumference of this point of breakage, suggesting a big toe is, is missing. And, and it appears to have broken uh, presumably about midfoot. And if you presumed that it, it continued on back as a, as a full-length foot, it would be remarkably similar to about a 16-inch Sasquatch track. It yeah, those Sasquatch that. tracks are big, boy. Yeah. And this has, what, what, what amazes me is the anatomical detail. The artist has, has indicated a flexion crease across the fore part of the foot that would correspond to um, uh, a crease that has appeared in some Sasquatch tracks. Uh, but yet, when you look at the top rendering, they even went to the bother of... Uh, of uh, carving out the toes as seen from above, but uh, the toes are very long, uh, suggesting that there's this thick sole pad that creates this kind of webbing up between the toes as seen from the inferior, the planter view. The other thing that's remarkable is that the, these long toes don't have any indication of claws, but instead have nails, very accurate nails. And, and upon Amazing. very close examination, you can, I mean, they, they even went to the detail of, of the nails have that little in curve, like where, where you tend to get a ingrown toenail as it kind of curves in underneath and and the detail is remarkable and of course the reason it's like that is they were seeing something not human and it was much more interesting to them that's why they went into such detail are there any legends that go along with these uh drawings well in in the case of uh, of some of the petroglyphs yes there are and, and they're often in areas where there have been both historically sightings and reports and encounters and, and even uh, contemporary times uh, 
one, ones that we examined uh, that had this remarkable depiction of the large feet and, uh, and uh, exaggerated five-digit hands was up a canyon that had uh, just in uh, well, a couple decades ago, I guess it was, there was a, a whole series of reports that uh, emanated from this area that involved the, the landowner and the rancher who had seen, seen this uh, creature uh, on his property. Um, so there are uh, the Native Americans are, are tend to be more circumspect in describing or discussing the significance of these petroglyphs because they have uh, you know spiritual significance for them right. and, and they are a little bit uh, and understandably reticent about uh, sharing that kind of intimate knowledge with, uh, uh, with white outsiders, people who, yeah. with outsiders who so often. Uh, denigrate or deride or, or trivialize or make fun of, of these beliefs that right. they hold, and, and so they would just as soon not. <laughs> well, we're going to up. take a little break right now, and when we get back, we're going to deal with this question, has Bigfoot ever been actually spotted in the context of the other question many of you are asking about the Patterson film, the Patterson Gamillan film, and also we're going to ask Jeff about DNA evidence. Is there any? We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. For those of you who are watching us for the first time on Blog TV, Dreamland is also available as an audio stream from Saturday afternoons at 3 p.m. on unknowncountry.com, my website. I'm the author, Whitley Strieber, and I've been doing this show for about 10 years. It's one of the larger, I guess, uh, blog, uh, audio blogs on the Internet. It has about 150,000 monthly listeners. And you can listen free to the last four shows. And if you subscribe, you can also listen to the last four years of programming for without any commercial breaks or commercial interruptions. So do subscribe to unknowncountry.com. It's a wonderful website. We depend entirely on paid subscriptions for our life, and we are doing, it's a very well-liked website, so I think you'll enjoy it, too. Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science, Jeff Meldrum's wonderful new book about Sasquatch. It's something that we are automatically trained to laugh about uh, by the snickering in the media, and yet a scientist as prominent as Jane Goodall is now saying that we really shouldn't be laughing about this, that there is something extraordinary here. And there are a couple of... Let me begin, Jeff, by asking you the DNA question. Do we have any DNA, Sasquatch DNA? Well, um, uh, not definitive, although, uh, as a sneak peek here, there there was a, an incident that occurred that I was involved in the investigation, and, and one of uh, my colleagues also involved... Uh, did run some analysis on a sample of uh, purported blood from uh, uh, from a sour slip in Canada, and it uh, it was a very challenging analysis because of some inhibiting factors that were preventing the the, the normal process that, that is followed to uh, generate a sequence of DNA. Now, now, when you say inhibiting factors, what do you mean? Well, there was something there, uh, some proteins or some bacterial action or something has, was uh, preventing the primers, which are the little, the little uh, sequences of DNA that are used to kind of jumpstart the process to rep- make a copy in order to make multiple copies that can then be, from which can be generated an actual sequence. And uh, it required him to subject the sample to uh, processes that would clean or remove or eliminate those inhibiting factors. He then got a, a short sequence, and it had uh, one particularly interesting substitution. Um, so one out of 300 uh, nucleotides had a, was differed from the human sequence. Now the question is, does that fall within normal human variation? And, and it's sometimes it's difficult to ascertain that for for uh, you know, particular samples, unless a large, large sample of uh, individuals are, are surveyed. If this animal is uh, very closely related to humans, say, for example, that it is more closely related than chimpanzees even, uh, say it is perhaps in that early hominid radiation, right. then we would expect less than maybe 1% to 3% 
difference in the DNA sequence. So, the, so one one out of three hundred is even less than that. I mean, we're down at uh, what uh, three three tenths of a percent difference. Um, so it, it it remains to be seen. It was intriguing. It was uh, it's a, it's a substitution that's not unknown in humans, but it's very unusual. And under the circumstances, the individual, if it was a human that left the blood, because and I won't divulge all the circumstances. It, it'll it'll be aired on a documentary here eventually. Uh, but it would have had to have had, the individual would have had to have had a 16-inch foot to have left the, the sign that it left. He's bound to be known in the neighborhood if he has a 16-inch yeah, foot. Exactly. <laughs> Problem is, this neighborhood is extremely remote, can only yes. be reached by float plane, and, uh, and is about 250 miles from any, anything in any direction. So. Well, if there's a guy that big living around there, anyone who had ever been in the area would certainly know him because he would have to make himself known Absolutely. from time to time. I think that we can assume that yeah. maybe this blood is the real thing. And But let me ask you another question. Are you familiar with any of the attempts to uh, sequence Neanderthal DNA? There have been a couple recently, I know. There have, yes. There have been, have been several. In fact, the most recent one was quite intriguing because it uh, was the, the, an analysis of DNA extracted from bones that were found in Siberia, right. which extended the range of the known range of Neanderthals, uh, several thousand kilometers to the... To and the how region. how close was this DNA to ours? Well, it falls out, I mean, w w when it was analyzed or compared with humans, rather than clustering more closely to any one particular group of humans, it fell completely outside. So in other words, it was, it was more different from uh, u modern European DNA then modern European DNA is different from Australian uh, Aborigines. So this actually tells us something. It tells us that whatever is out there, whatever Sasquatch is, from at, at the moment until we have more clear DNA evidence, the evidence we do have suggests that th this species may be branched off from the human species later than Neanderthals? Am I right about that? Or the, the, the oh, no, not necessarily, not necessarily. Okay, because the, the differences, that. I mean, the, the differences in this DNA, I mean, if, it, it's really, um, it's really uh, not prudent to, to draw too uh, uh, suggestive an inference or, or conclusion from only 300 bases. That's a very, I mean, typically... It's, it's just drawing, not enough. Yeah, you would oh. need to have hundreds, uh, or, or thousands rather, so 100 times that amount before any in, uh, really significant conclusions. But it's tantalizing. I mean, the, the fact that there was this uh, very unusual substitution that appeared in this sample, which either had to, I mean, the, the idea was uh, that the blood was originally was bare, uh, but it clearly wasn't bare. I mean, it was human blood, uh, or it was human-like blood uh, in, in the similarity of its DNA to, uh, to humans, but yet it had that unusual difference. Uh, so that, that that's intriguing. That's why I say, you know, while my working hypothesis is that this is a large grade ape, um, it may be more different from a grade ape than, than, uh, than I'm giving credit at this stage, you know. But, and, and this might be that missing evidence that I was saying, that there just was no evidence that I'd experienced yes. otherwise, that would suggest I abandoned that hypothesis and, and, and uh, explore another one yet. Now let's talk, we need to turn now to the Patterson film, the most famous piece of, uh, of uh, Bigfoot evidence in the world, a brief film of a strange creature moving up a creek bed with a long stride, obviously hurrying out of uh, sight. Now you ex extensively discuss this film in your book in the best analysis of the Patterson film I've ever seen. And tell us first a little bit about the Patterson film, and then let's go, we're get, getting rather close to the end of the show, so then let's go into a dis brief discussion of just uh, where you think this is. Is this evidence of Bigfoot or not? But first tell us a little bit about the origins of the film. Right. Well, uh, Roger Patterson had uh, become interested in this subject after reading an article by Ivan Sanderson in, in uh, Men's Magazine, and then 
he had uh, heard about or, or on, on trips down through California, had spoken to some of the locals and made some acquaintances. Al Hodgson, uh, who uh, uh, ran a, a little mercantile down in Willow Creek, uh, made him aware of the discovery of a rather extensive line of footprints that had been investigated thoroughly by John Green and Renee de Hinden. And so as soon as Roger could get uh, make arrangements and, and uh, persuaded his uh, friend, Bob Gimlin, who had the who had the horse trailer and the horses, and Bob had to take care of business on his ranch and so forth in order to go. So a couple weeks transpired before they were down there. In the intervening time, rain had kind of obliterated the tracks that they had wanted to seize, but they, they decided to stay on for several weeks to um, to look and prospect for, for more sign. And so they, they, had, they had been there for about two weeks, riding up and down these canyons and along the roads, on horseback and in the truck sometimes. And on that particular afternoon... Um, they uh, rounded a, a corner. Their view up the creek had been obstructed by this big crow's nest, a big tangle of, of uh, roots and trees. Uh, a flood had come through there a couple of years earlier. And there on the creek side, the, the horses suddenly reacted to the presence of something right there on the creek side. Uh, Roger's horse reared and fell on its side. He very uh, adroitly grabbed his camera from the saddlebag and yelled to Bob to cover him as he ran across the creek towards this retreating figure that was making its way, uh, angling upstream, up up the creek, uh, across this rather extensive sandbar. And this sand was, uh, uh, fortunately, was a, not just regular beach sand, but it was this uh, um, almost a schist, that uh, very angular, so it held yes. the tracks remarkably well, which allowed them to be studied by other people coming to the side. I actually had a sample of that sand, sand uh, examined and described by one of our physical geologists here on campus, and, and he made that very comment. He said, "He said the, the nature of the sand would, is such that it, it's excellent for holding tracks." And uh, anyway, so that's uh, that's what happened. He got uh, a few seconds, uh, well, a number of seconds of, of film. film. Of now, this, uh, did, didn't he say that it was a hoax before he died? Am I confused about no. that? No, no, he didn't. And this is uh, this. But somebody thing. did. After well, he died. right. There was well, there there were two stories that uh, that, that keep getting conflated. Roger did die of, of leukemia, uh, but but on his deathbed uh, maintained his story, and right up to the very end, um, there were two stories that seemed to have gotten conflated. One was the Wallace story, where Wallace Ray Wallace passed away. Ray was a foreman on a construction crew that was that was uh, building roads for salvage logging as a result of this flood that had ripped out this canyon that they were in. And uh, he, when he passed away, he, uh, his family claimed that all the footprints that had been left in the Northwest uh, were made by these wooden feet, these crude wooden feet that the Wallaces had. Which you can easily prove is not true. Right. I mean, you can flip open my book, and there's just yeah. a simple, you know, if, if the it's very straightforward. Fit, it's simply not yeah. true. It's a lie. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that story then was conflated too with um, uh, a gentleman. Uh, resident of Yakima, where Bob and, and uh, Roger were from, uh, claimed that he was the man in the first suit. And then he linked up with a gentleman from uh, out east somewhere, and I've, I've gone blank as to what state he was from, but uh, Philip Morris, who owns a, a very uh, successful and large uh, costume manufacturing company. The most, most gorilla suits that you've seen on various um, comedies from, you know, I Love Lucy and so forth have uh, been from his, uh, his stock, and he claimed that he looked at this uh, film and said, oh, that's one of my costumes. Well, <laughs> he's got a, a peculiar eye then, because uh, yes. anyone else that looks, it does. there's no obvious, any, uh, obvious comparison to be made. Now, we have just two minutes left okay. together, so uh, I would like, if you want to draw a conclusion here, I would like to know two things. First, uh, where do you think we are with this? Is Sasquatch real? And second, where are you going? Because this this book is a tremendous achievement by a, obviously a very skilled author and an excellent scientist. So I'm very excited about where you may be taking this incredible human adventure in the future. Well, thank you. Um, well, the, the, the intent of the book is not to convince people that Sasquatch is real, but rather it's to convince people, and particularly my scientific colleagues, that the evidence 
fully warrants and in fact begs for further scientific investigation into this question to resolve to resolve it definitively. I mean, I acknowledge that uh, that the the suggestive evidence that we have is not yet enough. We have to have, I mean, at least for official scientific recognition. So the the direction I'm taking that we're 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 taking it several ways. The one is uh, ongoing field work where uh, we're uh, our main objective being to collect. DNA, fresh, fresh tissue from which DNA can be extracted to make that definitive uh, assessment of, of the uh, genetic identity of right. whatever species this is. And then we're, we're also, I mean, I, I also conduct a lot of laboratory work and, and try to coordinate uh, others' efforts. I mean, the book has continually opened doors yes. and uh, brought people forward. So we have some new things happening with the hair analysis. We have some great things happening with uh, more systematic archiving and more quantitative analysis of the footprints. Uh, we have just launched a new online peer-reviewed journal called the Relic Hominoid Inquiry, which will uh, provide a venue for scholarly publications on uh, the, the, the search for Sasquatch, the study of its, the evidence, and other unrecognized hominoids from around the world. You know, we talked about the Yeti, the Orang Deck, right. uh, um, all these different uh, interesting phenomena that are uh, each individually suggestive of maybe relic populations of either apes or, in some instances, perhaps even hominids. Hominids. And we're going to have to finish yep. now, and uh, I would like to recommend your book again, uh, Sasquatch. Legend Meets Science from Tor Books, the author Jeff Meldrum, uh, an extraordinary book. It's not often that people like Peter Matheson and Jane Goodall speak up on behalf of research into Bigfoot, and they did that because of the quality of the effort that has been made here. Tremendously exciting reading. Thank you very much for being with us, Jeff Meldrum. Next up on Dreamland... Linda Moulton Howe. This week, Linda Moulton Howe's report comes from Florida, where, guess what's been seen again? Black triangles. That's right. And where can you find out more every day about this and so many other extraordinary edge science topics? But earthfiles.com. Linda tells the truth and gives you the facts the others will not on earthfiles.com. Don't miss earthfiles.com. Do support earthfiles.com and now here she is from albuquerque our own linda moulton howe well thanks whitley it was ten and a half years ago on march thirteenth nineteen ninety seven that a series of unidentified aerial objects showed up over the state of arizona beginning from around seven thirty p m until at least ten thirty p m that night the early evening craft was a huge black triangle with a few red lights underneath. Real estate professionals in Phoenix who saw it estimated that the low, slow-moving, and completely silent huge triangle was at least 1.8 miles long. And they based that calculation in a comparison to a 1.8-mile-long housing development that this triangle flew over. Another report that night was from a truck driver traveling on a freeway from the north of Phoenix to the south. He watched two large orange-white spheres pulsing on and off near Luke Air Force Base. Others videotaped and reported to local TV stations smaller white lights spaced evenly in an arc. Four months later, the U.S. government tried to explain the three hours of extraordinary aerial phenomena now known as the Phoenix Lights, as military flare exercises from Luke Air Force Base. None of the eyewitnesses believed that explanation. And now comes another multiple eyewitness sighting of two large orange-white spheres pulsing on and off while emitting smaller white glowing disks that circled the orange-white spheres and then took off after red lights in the distance as if in attack mode, the eyewitnesses thought. The location is Youngstown, Florida, northeast of Tyndall Air Force Base, which is in Panama City. The date was Monday, October 1, 2007. The time was approximately 
and four adults and two teenagers watched astonished as the red and white light seemed to be in conflict, followed soon after by the appearance of a large dark triangle with a few red lights that separated from the base of the triangle and flew off, maybe to encounter the white disc. One of the eyewitnesses is 45-year-old Thelma Landers, mother of 14-year-old Zach. She recently contacted me because she and her neighbors want to know if anyone else has seen the orange-white spheres, the smaller glowing discs, the red lights that were chased, or the huge triangle that moved over them at tree-top level, completely silent, as big as a football field. Thelma is twice divorced and now lives in a Youngstown trailer home raising Zach. She and her son had been to the supermarket to buy groceries and had just turned onto Highway 2301 when Zach became excited about lights in the sky. And my son said, Mom, look. And then there were two bright orange lights, bright white lights. To me, it had a tint of orange. Mm -hmm. There they were, and then they disappeared. We turned, we went to my home, parked in my yard, and I looked up as I was getting out of the truck, and I said, oh, wow, we seen the two large white lights, and then I seen a small white disc, like a really bright white, going around it, and I told my son, I said, run and get the neighbors. So my son went across the way, which is not too far, to get Anita, George, and Cody. Brian had came out of his home and asked what was going on, and he lives across the street from me. And I said, look up, and my son was saying, look up. So we had four adults and two teenagers standing in the yard, and I said, do you think it'll happen again? And Zach says, yeah, look at the little white light. And they were going around, and it looked like they were chasing after red fast things in the sky. And then it did it again. It lit up, just bright lights on, bright lights off. The little white things would circle it and then dart off when the lights went off. And then we talked about it in the yard. We didn't know what it was. The little white light. Did you, your son, or the neighbors, did any of you see the little white lights come out of either of the bigger white orangey lights? No. They just suddenly were there going in a circle around both of the orange white lights? It looked like the white lights were chasing the red lights, and every time the bright white lights would come on, the two larger ones, Uh it looked like they would go back to that circle around it go out real quickly, and then they dart off again, catching up to the red light. I see. And now the question is, are the little white bright lights taking orders from the larger lights or just exactly what was happening? They were in conflict. I feel like the red lights were trying to get away from the little tiny white lights, and it happened four times. And those little white lights or discs seem to definitely have a relationship to the two larger orange-white lights. Yes. How long did all this go on? It took about, I'd have to say, 45 minutes. Okay. You are all there. Right. What happened next? We were standing there talking about how the little white lights were chasing the red lights. I reached in the back of my truck, picked up my groceries, and my son said, Mom, look up, look up. And I turned around to see a very bright light coming towards me with a triangle shape coming very low over the treetop, coming over my home and over my head where I was standing. And it was triangle-shaped. I could see that it was very black, like if you had a cockpit on an airplane. It was round like that, but it was black. It was mostly in the front, like round. The lights went off real quick when I turned around and saw it, and then it hovered above us. And I said, does anybody hear a noise? They said, no. I could see that when the triangle-shaped object came over my head, it was very large. I'd have to say it was more than a half an acre wide. It looked like that because when I looked up, it was reaching on my property and over on the other property. And when I looked up, the two lights were on one left wing, one in the middle, and one partially almost the tip. 
and then one was on the far right wing, a red light, partially on the tip. When I looked up, I told myself, okay, don't pan it. And it looked like a gray and black color. And the light was really bright. The red light was really bright close to the center. And when I seen the bright light, I said, okay, I'm looking at something that looks like a red light inside of a box, inside of a box, because it had two lines, two squares going around it. And it kept moving slowly. And I said, well, I don't hear anything. And then... I worried to myself. I said, my son has got asthma. I said, this thing is going to put fumes out. It's close by. I said, are you all right? And they said, yeah. And next thing I know, this bright red light looks like the sun peeking through after rain, like it's peeking through a beam mm -hmm. with shining down on my eyes. It came in a movement of coming across. One straight line, it looked like red. It was a beam of light, but it was red. And when it came across my eyes, I said, uh-oh, and I was going to turn my head, and it caught me, and I shook it off, looked back up, and it was across the way, I'd say about a mile. By the time I came to my senses and looked up again, I had seen that it was in the distance. Everybody said, well, watch this. Look, look. And I heard my son say, watch the red light. Two of the red lights underneath it started off to the left, and one of the red lights on the right started off to the right. Now, do you mean those red lights left the bottom of that huge triangle and flew off? Yes. When they took off to the left, there were two, and then the right, one of the lights on the right took off to the right, and I knew there were three lights. I didn't hear any noise, and by the time that I came to my senses off the red light that flashed in my eyes, it was a little bit further out. You could see it going past my home, past my land, which I have an acre of land, and it was over there pretty good. I felt a breeze, just a large breeze after it had passed. And Thelma, I think what you're suggesting is that you became aware that there must be missing time if you went from seeing it close up over you and the red beam comes at your face, and the next thing that you know, it's far away. Yes, nobody said anything. I was quiet then. I said, I've got to get the groceries in. They're melting. And I was sort of confused and shocked because something so large had no noise, no fumes. And all of a sudden, two jets came close, the treetops on top of the trees. These two jets flew overhead very quickly. They had their lights on, and they went the other way. They didn't go towards the object. They did not even approach the object. It looks like they went completely the other way. So when did you start to think, maybe this is a UFO? I started to think that when I seen it coming over the treetops, as large as it was. Mm -hmm. I have never seen something that large, and I've never seen something so dark and black. And I looked underneath it and seen those lights, and I said, I've never seen this before. And I thought, oh, my God, my son, my neighbors, they're over there. I guess I was upset to see something so large and know that this can't be one of ours. We don't have that kind of technology, I thought. Mm -hmm. But when it came over us, there was no sound. When I talked, there was no echo between the two homes. Usually there's an echo between my home and my neighbor's home. But when I talked, it sounded like a voice. I couldn't hear the crickets. I couldn't hear the frogs in the swamp. I couldn't hear the dogs bark. There was no noise at all. And while this huge triangle was over you, you were about 200 feet away from your son and the neighbors? Right. When the red beam came out of this huge triangle, it was aimed only at your face? I don't know. Something had happened, and more time had gone on than you were consciously aware. And I wonder, did you feel any heat or cold or tingling or anything when the red beam of light hit your face? When I looked up and it did flash in my eyes, I worried about my eyes. And I said, well, I'm wearing glasses, so it didn't hurt me as much. So when I was inside my home, I looked at my son and I told him, I said, I feel like I've been burned. It feels funny on my left side of my face. He said, did you get burned? I go, I don't know. I said, I just feel funny. I said, it feels kind of red. And he said it was red. My son said it was red. 
he didn't say to you, I saw the red beam of light come out of the big triangle and hit your face? No. By then you were thinking UFO from someplace in outer space? I was hoping it was one of our military projects, and I thought to myself, this couldn't have been one of our military projects because the military flew away from it. It is almost as if this large triangle showed you that it was responsible for the red flying object. Right, and we all discussed it as we were standing there that it looks like the white lights were chasing the red lights, and we couldn't understand that. Like they were in conflict. They were in conflict, and it went on for some time because we seen the big two white lights with those tiny little glow lights just chasing the red lights. We've seen this four times, and we sort of got the notion it was maybe like a chase. What happened the very next night? I tried to go to sleep, and my little Jack Russell dog... It's a Jack Russell three-year-old? Three years old. He's very well-trained. He's a very quiet dog because I told him to be quiet most of the time, and he knew that when I said be quiet, that was to be quiet. And we went to sleep, and my dog jumped up on the bed, came beside me, and the window was above my head, and he started to growl. And I've never seen him act like this. Usually he would wolf, one little wolf, if there was something outside, you know, another dog or anything. But he growled low. And this was warning you? This was warning me because he was waking me up. He actually came up to me and poked his nose on my nose, and I heard him growl again, and I said, this isn't right. And I sat up, and I said, what is it? He growled again. I said, okay, I'll get up, and I opened the curtain slightly. The security lights weren't on, and I peeked outside, and I was scared. I thought I had seen an object out there, and then the security lights came on, and I heard another growl. It was a low growl, and I went back to my bedroom, and he growled again, and he looked out the window, and I told him to be quiet. My son woke up. I said, Mom, what's wrong? What is it? He said, Mom, is it alien? But what do you think you saw? I thought I had seen two heads. And I thought, okay, it was a light color. And I'm not seeing things very well. The light, the security lights weren't on. So when I seen the two heads just the top of them, my mobile home is up high because of the swamp. We have a swamp area here. And my trailer is like the window, maybe eight foot. And when I peeked out the window, I had seen the object, two of them. One was in front, one was in back, and all I could see was the head. I went to the front, and I thought to myself, well, the security lights aren't on. I looked, and they popped on. My dog was acting very strange, and I told him when I went back to the bedroom, he was growling. I said, lay down, and he didn't want to lie down. He would watch, and he would look where my air conditioner is, and he would point towards the air conditioner and the corner of it's the end bedroom. So my bedroom would be at the end, and he kept looking towards the end of my trailer, pointing outwards towards, you know, there was somebody there I had thought on the outside of my mobile home. Right, and the very first thing that your son said upon waking was, Mom, is it alien? Yes. Did you ask your son why he woke up asking that question? No, I thought, I don't want to scare him, but I told him, no, go back to sleep. I sat up all night. And did you ever try to see what might be out there at the air conditioner? My thought was, when I shut the curtain, I thought, okay, there's two heads out there, and it's dark, and the heads were lower, and I thought, there's no possible way someone could reach up to the window. And I tried to tell myself, there's no way there could be aliens outside that window. And when my son said, Mom, is it aliens? I didn't want to scare him. I didn't want to say, oh, well, by the way, I just seen something out my window. No, I didn't tell him that. But my dog was saying it for me. My dog said a lot. When he growls and acts the way he did, it tells me a lot. I mean, don't open the window. Don't move. Don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And your dog was telling you, if you try to go out, it could be very dangerous. Yes, he was right behind me every step of the way. Never seen this kind of behavior before. Yeah.
We're talking on Tuesday, October 16th, so it has been two weeks since this all occurred. Have you had or your son had any really clear virtual reality dreams in these past two weeks about discs, triangles, or non-humans? I have had no sleep, hardly. He goes to school and keeps busy, pretty much. I ask him twice, did you have any dreams? Are you okay? He says, no, Mom, I'm okay. And he doesn't want to talk about it, really. I went out there one time this week and shined the light on the field. There's about two acres that has tall grass in it. And I took my truck out there. I shined the lights out there because my son was scared. And he thought, Mom is alien. But I didn't see anything. Did you ever go and look around your air conditioning to see if you could find any evidence that anybody or anything had been there? Yes, I did. And the next day, I went outside, got the dog on his leash, and I looked around my window, and I had seen that the area in some places looked like something heavy was there because it pressed down the grass, just as if they were footprints. And when your security lights come on. Do they come on automatically by a motion sensor outside? Yes. So that night when your dog was alarmed and woke you up with a growl and when you got up the lights were not on. They were not on. As you got up and you're following your dog, that's when the lights turned on outside. Yeah, suddenly provoked by something outside that you couldn't exactly see. Right. Where's our military? Where's our jet? You know, they should be here. They should be stopping all this. And if the red lights are associated with that gigantic silent triangle and the little white lights are associated with the larger orange-white lights, right? what is the problem, the conflict between the big triangle and those orange-white lights? And who is in the triangle and who is in the orange-white light? I don't know when the triangle object came over our head we were speechless we were i was scared i know anita was scared and the two men there brian and george didn't know what to say and of course the kids were there well they're teenagers they didn't know what to say and as a reporter my frustration is that i know that our government knows a great deal about what is happening with non-humans on this planet but they want everybody to accept when they say there's nothing there, a policy of denial. Right. This this UFO or this object that came by, I felt like there was a chase and there was a conflict in the skies, and I felt like this object didn't mind showing itself to us or to anybody else around, and I felt like that was his territory. That was that object's territory. It just moved slowly over the horizon. The triangle was telling us, and this is what scared us most, It was telling us that it had control. Everything's under our control. We don't care if you see us. Here we are. This is our territory, and there's nothing you can do. And when we saw the jets fly by and go the opposite direction, and then we saw, like, a conflict in the sky, it had us all thinking, well, is our military going to do something? We didn't know what to think. All we knew That object, that triangle in the sky, with no noise, whoever was in there, they didn't care if we seen it or not. And we're all upset by that. And what's so interesting is that that occurred right after you saw those little white lights leave the larger orange-white lights and go after, in an attack mode, the red lights that might have been from the large triangle. Right, right. They knew the chase was on. And if there is conflict, what is the conflict about? And what does our government know about who's in that triangle, who's in those orange-white lights? And does our government know what the conflict is about and can't do anything to interfere? Right. And our government, we know that the jets flew by. They know the location. They knew exactly where it went. And they did not come tell the people. Nothing was reported on the news. Everything's quiet. Whitley, do you have any idea what kind of non-human would be in these large, silent, black triangles? 
Well, uh, yeah, Linda, I think that it's classically the Greys that she's dealing with. And, uh, however, it seems like there's three parties involved here. Human beings who, uh, turned tail and scuttled off and Greys and somebody else. It could be two different groups of Greys. That's also quite possible. I, that certainly happened before. But it's, Linda, I have to take my hat off to you. This is one of the best Close Encounter reports I've ever heard in my life. It's phenomenal. It's well, a brilliant job. Well, thank you. And I thought this was highly important as well. To, uh, and I've asked her to stay in touch. And believe it or not, uh, when I did that interview with her on the 16th, uh, two nights or a night later on the 17th, I received an email from uh, a group of men who were 140 miles south of that general Panama City area, also in this past week, and they are writing and sending me drawings that they are seeing extraordinary, what, white, yellow, red, unusual lights. I don't know how far this story is going, but oh, me Lord. Up. something is happening in Florida, and we have so many military installations there. Uh, Linda, something, you know, this thing is getting closer and closer. It's like a little old fly that's been buzzing around the human species for a long time and is starting to land for a few minutes here and there because we have had many close encounter reports, few close encounter reports that also involve sightings like this. And I can count on the fingers of one hand where a person has a continuity of memory from a sighting through a close encounter, through uh, attempts to investigate subsequent to the encounter, etc., and so forth. And this is the first one where there's been a sequence like this in the same immediate area. And that she might have had, the whole group might have had, missing time. Missing time. They did have. When that red light went and hit her on the side of her head. And I find that so fascinating because the only conscious way she knows that something occurred is she knew the light came, she knew that she shifted her head, and then she felt very confused. And when she next visually is looking, this huge triangle that was right up near above her in the trees is now at least, she estimated, at least, Nearly a mile away. So they they were they were abducted. There's no question whatsoever in my mind about it, and they know it very well. Poor people. I just my heart goes out to this little woman and her little boy. Uh, I have to tell you, Linda, it's hard. It's hard doing this. Uh, when and what's even harder is we've come to the end of our time together, Linda Moulton. How as always, EarthFiles.com. Don't miss a single day, obviously, and Dreamland. This is about the only place left nice species of primate out there and i think that's that's where i mean we've always been challenged by by this uh, the the unfortunate stigma that that has <clears throat> um has, has lumped this subject with uh with uh, various and sundry other topics some of which i mean i'm not passing judgment on any of these others but uh but many of which have not been fortunate enough to have uh, uh, the uh, the solid evidence, the uh, physical evidence and trace evidence that that is mounting um, in the case of the question of Sasquatch, and, and uh, so some scientists, many scientists, have, have shied away from it. Those that were interested, that weren't uh, that weren't uh, prone to in a knee jerk reaction, reject it outright and offhandedly. Um, yes. Now, now we're starting to have more people speak out a little bit and say, well, yes, we, we really should look at this. We really should consider this uh, data as, uh, as scientists are, are charged to, to do. You know, uh, Tom Slick was a good friend of, friend of my family's, and mm-hmm. his, I guess she is his daughter-in-law, uh, or by marriage, uh, well, obviously by marriage, <laughs> she's his daughter-in-law. Uh, Catherine Nixon Cook is, is a dear friend of ours to this day. Yeah. And I know uh, Catherine Cook recently uh, experienced, uh, for example, the Yeti that uh, drew Slick's attention to the Himalayas. The um, 
we've done some interesting things on, on analyzing some of the footprints that have been attributed to the Yeti, and uh, a great number of them can easily be uh, uh, dismissed as, uh, or, or explained rather, as uh, misidentified uh, footprints of, of common wildlife, like bears, for example. And, and there seems to be a blurring, in fact, in between the in the boundary between the notion of a bear-like figure and an ape-like figure amongst the uh, Sherpas and, and uh, indigenous populations yes. in that region. And the, um, the wait, wait, the yeah. bear-like figure enters quite a bit yeah. into your uh, and into your book, and right. how I think quite often people are thinking that bears are actually. Uh, 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 of various kinds are actually Sasquatch. That happens a lot. I think that does. Uh, I think it does. And and uh, you're right. In, in the book, uh, Lynn Rogers, uh, a brilliant uh, bear biologist, uh, discusses that. Uh, he actually thinks that it's probably more likely uh, the the reciprocal, and that is that people may see a Sasquatch, and and because they cannot fit it into their world view, into their frame of reference. They they rationalize it as well. It must have been a bear, and that that may have ha- may happen as often as other misidentifications in the reverse, be seeing a, a flat to an edge, and it's not so credible. <laughs> but this is different. This is the best Sasquatch book I personally have ever read. Uh, to be honest with you, and I've read a lot of them. Well, thank you. It has also been a source of wonder for me. Can you tell me a little bit about? Why you came to this? Because you have you have taken this to a new level. This is not a this is not really speculative anymore. Uh, once one reads this book, you you know there is something out there. Uh, from and, and there are prominent scientists who are agreeing with you more than than Jane Goodall, uh, Peter Matheson, uh, uh, Esteban Sarmento, uh, research associate at the Ma- American Museum of Natural History. Uh, quite a laundry list of of prominent names, names that never would have spoken out about this before your book. Well, that, that was been, or has been, one of the objectives of, of, this, uh, of this endeavor was to try to, to elevate the, the level of discourse, to try to, to uh, move this from the realm of the, uh, uh, you know, just being lumped in with all things paranormal, considered paranormal or, or mysterious, to a simple question of biological science, and that is, is there a biological species of primate that lies behind the legend of Sasquatch? And we have tried to, uh, to enumerate the evidence as, as it uh, is currently understood that suggests that, in fact, there is. Uh, went to, uh, to uh, Nepal and retraced Tom Slick's footsteps, and he was the first to really put any stock in any of this. And he attempted back in the 50s, with all sorts of limitations we don't have now, a scientific expedition in search of the of the Yeti. Now, it, and let me begin by asking if you think that this is a uh, an international phenomenon or is it just confined to the uh, Olympic forest, for example? Well, there, there certainly are... Um elements of the the wild man motif the icon uh sprinkled throughout cultures uh, worldwide it does really seem to be a, a universal phenomenon and there's been a lot of very interesting discussion about why that is if this is some um a holdover of our uh, of, of of times early in the history the prehistory of the human family when we very likely shared this planet with other hominids and other very human-like apes that were more common than they are today? Or is it much more pragmatic, much more fundamental, in that there simply are uh, some of those species uh, persisting in various corners uh, in appropriate habitats around the globe? It's not um, a uniform... uh... What probably is one of the most extraordinary... Sasquatch uh, stories you will ever hear. We have been talking about Sasquatch on this radio program for ever since Art Bell started it, and we have never been able to really come to a conclusion about what it was. We have listened to hoaxers. We have listened to 
fake and possibly real Sasquatch calls. We have talked to everybody, but we have never before talked to Jeff Meldrum about his book, Sasquatch, Legend and Science. And something has happened. And I'll just sum it up very simply. Dr. Jane Goodall, the founder of the Jane Goodall Inst- Institute, one of the one of the famed scientists working with primates, has said this about this book. Jeff Meldrum's book, Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science, brings a much-needed level of scientific analysis to the Sasquatch or Bigfoot debate. Welcome, Jeff Meldrum, to the program. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, it's very exciting to have you here because we have a uh, great interest on, the, on Dreamland in credible edge science, and uh, that's what the show is all about. And very often we go out on